Thank you and good evening. Graduates, huge congratulations. Your families and all the people who, you, who love you are very proud. And I'm proud of you too, and most of us have not even met. This is an awesome day in your life. You deserve to celebrate. Throw your hats in the air, do a happy jig, and eat loads of good food tonight and tomorrow, and as long as you can. My wish for you is to have as many occasions for similar joy in the years ahead. I trust that you will. The greetings also and sincere thanks to the staff and faculty here at the Department of Communication who made this ceremony possible. Chancellor Wilson, it's a special honor to see you. I was really flattered to be asked to join you today. It's a little awkward, I'll admit, to participate in this way when I still feel like I have so much unfinished business left in my life and in my career. Like you, I'm starting a new chapter with a new baby son, just one month old, and less than a year into a new job that's very different from the last one that I held. I hope that I can nonetheless offer a few useful ideas, even if I don't have decades of accumulated wisdom that a more traditional speaker might have offered. The nine years since I finished grad school in Zoom by, I've had an exhilarating decade with highs and lows, very few of which were at all predictable. On the surface, my adventure from Wheeling to the University of Illinois to the state capitol and then back to the University of Illinois at a different campus is unlikely. My parents were born deaf. My mom never attended college. My dad, against long odds, earned his bachelor's degree after getting through high school and his first two years of college without the benefit of a sign language interpreter. Thank you, by the way, to our great interpreter. My dad struggled through unemployment and underemployment and exclusion through long periods during my childhood adolescence and even my adult, encountering exclusion, discrimination, and disrespect based on his disability. But, of course, I enjoyed a lot of advantages in my life as well. My parents devoted their lives to my older brother and to me with unconditional love and support. Plus, I had incredible teachers in Wheeling's public schools. Perhaps the best early life choice that I made was to join the debate team at my high school. Because my coach, who is with us tonight, Don Tantillo, who is like a father to me, helped me understand that with practice, it was possible for a kid from Wheeling, whose parents were very different from most others, to compete with anyone. The communication program at the University of Illinois, thus, was a natural fit. Let me take you back a little bit. This campus in the early 2000s was fertile ground for a young person interested in politics and public policy. In between lively debates on campus about the Iraq War and the re-election of George W. Bush, I found time to get involved in local politics as campaign volunteer for Dan McCullough, who was a former mayor of Champaign who ran and lost by less than a thousand votes in a race for the Illinois State Senate. Now, it's tempting uh, to get cynical about politics, so I, I apologize for going there. But I implore you, even those of you who are uninterested at all in the political scene, to participate in a campaign. Unlike a lot of other activities, campaigns at every level have a direct impact on the future of our society. Do more than just vote. Knock on doors, march on a parade, or run for office yourself, whether you're an independent, a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, a Green, a Green Bean, a Green Hornet, I don't care what you are, get involved. Informed citizens owe it to generations of American veterans to participate in the electoral process. Pick a race, whether it's for your local library, or your school board, or for President of the United States, and get in the arena. Involvement in that one campaign in 2012, and to, forgive me, in 2002, brought me to a volunteer dinner where, for the first time, way back then, 
I saw then State Senator Barack Obama as a crowd of fans. Toward the end of my undergraduate years, like most people, I asked myself, what's next? I applied for jobs with Teach for America, with a commercial insurance brokerage firm where I had interned for a couple of summers. And with the encouragement of my undergraduate advisor, Barbara Hall, she's back there, I applied for a master's program right here in communication, where I felt at home. I picked more school over those other options. And I told the brokerage firm I would return after graduating with my master's. Well, the master's program in communication gave me my first opportunity to teach, to work in a department research lab, and to write a thesis. In the last semester of my graduate coursework, a fellow student in our research lab forwarded me a job list that she found on a university job board calling for applicants interested in working in the Illinois Lieutenant Governor's office. I applied on a total whim because the job post said that the office was looking for someone to staff a state commission focused on improving telecommunications access in underserved communities. This was one of the focuses of my thesis research, and it was a topic close to my heart. So I went for it. I got hired, and I moved to Springfield, diving into the office at the lowest possible rank in state government. The job title was Fellow. Just Fellow, as in he's a nice fellow. <laughs> I enjoyed the fellowship, and I continued on Captain staff for three years as uh, lieutenant governor. And then I stayed on for his entire six years as governor, as Dave mentioned, taking on increasing responsibility as the years went by until he appointed me as chief of staff in 2013. While I had some extraordinary experiences in state government, I did my best to manage the human hardships that none of us can avoid. I can't say that I ever responded perfectly or even adequately uh, in those difficult times. In late 2008, when I was 25 years old, my mom passed away after an 18 year battle with ovarian cancer. She braved multiple rounds of major surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation treatments from the time I was a little kid to the time I turned 25. Eight years later, I still miss her terribly. Although her death did not come as a surprise, it was a singular turning point in my personal life. Just a few months before a tectonic shift took place in our state government. Then Governor Lugoy, which y'all know the story, was facing impeachment hearings and imminent arrest and the conviction that would propel my boss into the governor's office overnight. Professionally, I had to keep it together and trudge forward as I walked through inescapable grief. During the time after my mom's death, I poured myself into work. Under Governor Quinn's leadership, we made our share of mistakes, but we accomplished lasting changes that I'm proud of. For starters, we stabilized the government in chaos. We won civil unions for Illinois same-sex couples in 2011. And after a Herculean effort, we passed full marriage equality in this state in November of 2013. We implemented the biggest capital construction program in Illinois history. A highlight, of course, for me was the long overdue renovation of Lincoln Hall, where before the renovations, I spent years toiling in rooms that smelled like some horrific combination of dust, must, and old coffee. We expanded health coverage to nearly a million previously uninsured people, and we passed honest budgets that properly funded higher education, including math scholarships to support students like myself from low-income families. When natural disasters devastated Illinois communities, we marshaled millions of dollars in state and federal resources to rebuild, including the town of the village, rather, of Gifford, right here in Champaign County. But despite all the good we tried to do in November of 2014, facing a self-funding, smooth-talking tycoon with lofty promises and bitterly negative campaign rhetoric, Pat Quinn walks in a grueling bid for re-election. And with it, virtually all of us on his staff and in the leadership of state agencies he led found ourselves out of work. But beyond facing unemployment, I was wracked with a lot of regret. The loss represented a major setback 
for an ambitious, progressive agenda that I still believe in. So in the aftermath of a campaign defeat that was stinging, with a young family at my side, I again wondered, kind of what many of you may be wondering, what's next? It sounds strange to say, but working in state government became a part of my identity. So when we lost the election, I found myself asking the same fundamental questions that I puzzled through as I prepared to graduate. Who am I? What do I want to be? I considered entering the, private, the world of private lobby, public relations, consulting, as is the path of many former government staff members. After a lot of introspection, I decided to remain in Springfield and pursue work in the public interest. And I like under dogs. So when the chancellor at the University of Illinois Springfield suggested she was looking for a new associate chancellor who would double as her chief of staff, I jumped at the opportunity, applied, and landed on my feet. Advocating for higher education in the midst of an unprecedented budget crisis from the smallest university of Illinois campus has been a fitting and rewarding mission. Now, among the responsibilities in my new job is to promote the Springfield campus of the University of Illinois everywhere I go. I forgive anyone in attendance tonight, by the way, who did not know until just now that U of I has the Springfield campus. <laughs> so for any graduate out there who's unsure of the next step, consider this an invitation. UIS offers 21 master's degrees <laughs> proximity to the state capital in just 80 minutes from our beloved alma mater. If you'd like more details, I'll be around after the ceremony with the brochures. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's who I asked Graduates, if you're now just beginning your adventure, I promise whether you have a plan or not, the time will move really fast. So buckle up. As communications graduates, you have a wide range of options. Embrace that. Your broad skills, developed on this campus and off, are a shield that can guard you in times of uncertainty and career doubt. As in your personal life, trust your heart. Sometimes this will not yield the highest pay or the most straightforward career path. Our time on Earth is really short, and most of us will spend the bulk of it working. So do work that you enjoy, and enjoy the work that you do. For those of you pursuing international work, I salute you. But to the rest of you, remember, you do not need to cross oceans to find a meaningful purpose in this place. Just open a local newspaper. Challenges abound. You don't need to go to Silicon Valley, to New York City, or to Los Angeles to lead breakthroughs or to put your skills to the test. There are problems in our backyards that demand creative, bright communicators. Literally, there is a problem in my backyard right now having to do with buffalo nets which I would love your input on. Surely someone here can find a friend in the entomology department and coordinate with an appropriate uh, local response to the scourge of these pests. I'm only kidding. But seriously, consider the K-12 school funding formula scheme in our state, regarded by leaders in both major parties as deeply flawed. This is the way we pay for kindergarten for kids in school. The people attempting to solve this problem are not mathematicians or accountants, despite the fact that it's all about a formula. Finding a new and better way to fund our schools will demand the awareness and involvement of smart people of good conscience. People like you. Don't sell yourself short. Don't let others tell you, and certainly don't tell yourself, that you're incapable of taking on major assignments in your first job, of navigating intractable problems in your community, or fighting major battles at the state, federal, or global levels. Our hardest social problems need people with common sense who can read, write, and speak with clarity and conviction. The toxic, festering dysfunction and gridlock in our politics is often as much about communication as it is about political policy disagreement. People talk past each other. They inadvertently offend each other. And the consequence of these communication debacles can be staggering. Deep human suffering can result when those in power fail to communicate effectively with one another. This is why employers, large and small, in the public, private, and not-for-profit arenas need people like you who can bring clarity and competence to communication. 
I will leave you with this quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, which reinforces my faith in you and has inspired me to take many risks that I would never regret. She said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You're able to say to yourself, I have lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. Class of 2016, go do things you previously thought impossible. Congratulations again to every graduate, to your families, and to your friends. Savor for a few moments what a great privilege it is to have made it this far, but remember, you're just getting started. Thank you for letting me share it.